off screen, she became almost like a surrogate mother to me. Um, I would stay with her and she would, um, if, if she was very good at sorting everybody out, anybody who had a problem, she had a great sense of being able to see what your problem was, sense that you had a problem. And she would bring things in, you know, if she felt you were particularly stressed, she would bring in a huge lavender candle, like sort of this big for you to have in your bath. Or she'd invite me to stay for the weekend at her house and she would bring me breakfast in bed. Just, you know, <laughs> like, hang on a minute, you know, we're all working, we've all got to get up at five, but she'd still be up half an hour before. And she has an amazing ability to do that to everyone around her, I think. And um, I miss that. I still see her, but obviously I don't see her as much now. And, and I do miss that feeling of being looked after and protected. Now it's all down to my own mum, who's very good at it, but gets a bit weary of me wanting it at my age. The wonderful thing about, about working with Judy was that she would always be up for anything. I mean, our, our, our director, producer, um, was, was, uh, is quite conservative himself. And um, a lot of the girls in makeup and costume and floor management, whatever, would dress as girls who do that kind of work a day job nowadays, um, would dress. And uh, they would wear uh, air soled shoes or sneakers or, you know, and, and practical, comfortable things. And um, he one day said, um, you know, I really lament the time way back in the, in the 60s when women really used to dress up. And women used to wear high-heeled shoes and, you know, proper stockings and things like that. And women don't look like that nowadays, you know. They dress in this sort of androgynous way and it's very boring. And so immediately Judy went into overdrive and arranged for all of us, all the women, I have to say, not the men, well, she tried to get the men, but they weren't having any of it, to turn up in black dresses, long black gloves, and black fishnets tights to rehearsal. It's extraordinary because he had no idea what was happening. And as each of these women came through the door <laughs> and took their coat off, he suddenly realized that uh, you know, his dream had come true. So he stopped the whole rehearsal, sent out for cameras, and had the whole thing recorded on film for, for posterity. But after that, of course, any event from there on in, Judy wanted us all to wear black dresses and black gloves and black fish neck ties. But, um, so we did it a few more times, but obviously it didn't work as well after that. But we did have a picture taken. We all dressed one day again in the gear and we got all the, the crew to line up with us. So we had a huge picture and all the women were in the black dresses, the crew weren't. But we had it specially, I don't know what they did to it, but the, the studios, put all the crew in the photographs in black dresses and fishnet tights and long black gloves. We had the sound men and the gaffers and they were all there. So the picture looked like they were all dressed like this, which they all thought was very funny except for one particular sound man who got very upset apparently because I must admit it didn't suit him. So he was very unhappy about that. It was just little things like that, you know, any opportunity. We would hide, you know. The director would go out for his lunch and uh, we'd get back early and then she'd say, Let's just hide. To hide under chairs, behind sofas, in wardrobes, whatever ha piece of set happened to be around, everyone would hide. So the person who'd come back would think we'd all gone for a tea break or something. And so we used to have to do this quite a lot. And for quite a while, it was fun. And then one day, Geoffrey Palmer decided he wasn't going to do it anymore. And he refused to get in the wardrobe. He refused to get behind anywhere. And he sat squarely in the middle of the set on the sofa. And I think it was the director that day who'd gone out to make a film who came back. And Jeffrey said, they're here, they're still here. They're, Judy's in there, Maura's behind there, Jenny's over there. And that was the last time we ever did that. But, um, but it was fun while it lasted. Her dog was there that day, I remember. And uh, so she left the dog tied up to a table then. And uh, we all disappeared into different parts of the room and just hid. And he came back in, thought, where is everybody? Oh, well, they must still be up at lunch. And started talking to this dog. You know, like you do when you're alone in a room and you think nobody's listening. And it was only the fact that the wardrobe that Judy had locked herself into started to shake from side to side with uncontrolled laughter that, um, that he ever discovered it. But it's just things like that, every opportunity, you know. Let's get away from the seriousness of what we're doing and, um, and let's just have a laugh. For a while, but Judy loves to make jokes. That's, how, that's her sort of thing. That's how she keeps everything fresh, is she has this amazing ability to make everything fun. 
So even though she's been at it forever, she still has no cynicism about her. She's never fed up. She's never bored by it. She never has that thing of, oh, God, we've got another day. We've got she doesn't have that. She manages to keep everything bubbling. There's always a bedroom scene as time goes by. So we all decided that we would, uh, we would have a picture taken in this bed just before the shoot started. So we all climbed on this bed, and the whole bed collapsed. And um, I know the designer was very angry about it, but because, uh, of course, he had to rebuild a bed in the half an hour that he got before the audience came in. So The, the, the tapings were always great fun because, uh, you're, unlike, unlike in a theatre, you're able to go back and do it all over again. The thing is that the audience have got to laugh all over again, so you've got to convince them that, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, although they've seen it once um, and laughed once in an instinctive way, they're now going to have to manufacture that laugh over again. Sometimes you've got you've to tweak it and do it slightly differently so that um, you can freshen it up. Um, there's always a warm-up guy there to do that, but uh, we'd usually find a way of, of freshening it up and, uh, you know, of changing a line. Um, the danger with it, though, is that uh, Judy Dench, one of her great... The only failing that, Je that Judy Dench has is, is, the, is the fact that she laughs. Um, we call it corpsing. I, I think you probably have the same name for it in America. And uh, it means that uh, she loses it for a moment and, and just laughs uncontrollably. But Jeffrey's a great straight man because that, that face doesn't crack under any circumstances. And um, so he, would always, he could always throw Judy a curveball and, um, you know, and try and get her going and the twinkle would happen in the eye, and the lip would tremble. And sometimes she'd get through it, and sometimes she wouldn't. But, uh, but that just kept it fun. That keeps it fresh for us. It's important that, if, that we keep it fresh for ourselves, so it seems fresh uh, to the audience. And, um, no, it was a lot of fun. Jeffrey, I didn't get to know so quickly. Um, he was slightly more reserved than Judy, um, and very warm. Uh, maybe because he wasn't playing my father and because of the way the characters were. So I didn't get to know him so quickly. It took probably the m most of the first series to get to know him better. Um, and then what you realise with Jeffrey is that all he really wants to do is go fishing. He doesn't really want to do anything else. He just wants to go fishing, which is what he loves the best. And as the years went by, all the programmes would be shifted around the fishing seasons and when they could get drag him off of a fishing boat to come into the studio. And, but he's a, a truly nice man and he's a man who didn't become well known until quite late in his career. He, he may have told you this already. And so he struggled a bit in his early years and because he always had a face, an old lived in face, and he sort of had to grow into that. So in his early years he struggled very hard. So he had great empathy with the younger actors on the set and, and how difficult they might find it, how nervous they might be or how out of work they may have been. And so he was lovely for that. He's never, ever forgotten what that was like for him in, in his early days. He's a sweet man. Judy's kind of like the character she plays. Jeffrey isn't like the character he plays at all. Um, you know, Lionel's very conservative uh, in his dress, in his attitudes. Um, he has that sort of hangdog look. You know, people have always called him, or certain people have always pointed out that uh, he could very easily be called the, the English Walter Matta, you know. Um, and uh, I always thought he should play Richard Nixon, but um, that never really came up. There is something about him. Next time you, you have a look at him, just think, yes, he could be playing Richard Nixon, this guy. Anthony Hopkins doesn't bear any resemblance, but, you know, Jeffrey Palmer should have played him. And uh, Jeffrey is... Uh, is a lovely, generous, funny man, and uh, not at all that kind of hangdog grump that you get on the, on the screen. But that's because he's a great character actor. It came as a huge surprise to all of us, I think, that as time goes by, it did become popular in the States. Now it has become popular. Uh, everyone in the States must know better than me why that's happened. I imagine it's because it's kind of clean and nice, and uh, it's a pleasant change to have a kind of geriatric romance um, rather than the obvious young, youngish people. Um, and it's a sort of harking back to when there wasn't 
racism or terrorism or violence or something. Um, 